eye contact. Oh, that's to be very nice. Yeah, that's gorgeous. Welcome. Welcome. Hello. To Art and. My name's Nathan. And my name is Sophie. And today we are talking about art and identity. identity. We are both figurative oil painters who have recently graduated art uni and we are broadening our horizons and our practices. Mm, and we're just having open discussions about a number of topics, how it relates to us, our practices and the practices of other artists. So mm. what do we mean by the term identity? Really good question because I remember when we were brainstorming this on, on the mind maps and I was like, easy, so easy, so difficult, so difficult. very meaty. I have a really lovely sort of definition from an article published by the Tate and it's called Cultural Identity. It's a really, really good article. And they say that identity can be made up of attributes such as gender identity, sexuality, race, religion, heritage or class. Your identity is not necessarily limited by these terms. However, mm. it can be influenced or a can shaped. be shaped by by these attributes. Mm. What things would you say make up your identity? Of things that oh. who you define yourself as? I like that question. As, oh, thanks like so much. I would say my identity is made up of the things I love, what I understand to be like who I am. Not only my experiences with my gender and my transition. Like, I would say, like, being trans is, like, this, this much. Mm. And for podcast listeners, this is very, very small. Yeah. <laughs> my, my fingers are very close together. Yeah. Um, whereas, like, the things I love, the things I do, what I enjoy, my hobbies, my skill set is, like, the other, like, 90%. Mm. The fact that I'm, like, queer and I'm trans, like, I love it and I love... I love me and I love that part of me, but it isn't all of me. It's not the most interesting thing about you. Exactly. Which I is... would say the most interesting thing about me is how much sugar I put in my tea. Jesus Christ. Yeah. <laughs> That's more interesting of a talking... Interesting worrying. Th yeah. <laughs> what about you, Miss Fletcher? What makes up your identity? I was thinking this and your answer's actually a lot better than what I was thinking. <laughs> because you had this thing of like, it's what I love and whatever. And in my head, it was just like my top trumps of like tits <laughs> tits woman um i think in recent years i want to say in the past like 18 months mm -hmm. i think me being an autistic person has very much been welcomed into Absolutely. the little community that is my identity because it was something that i found very very i didn't really want to welcome it because of yeah. all the connotations with mm -hmm. everything like in the neurodivergent world it's not especially necessary. as being an autistic woman that comes with quite a lot of weight. This is what's interesting about it, I think, because, yeah, I think that's definitely shaped it where actually me being an autistic woman, mm -hmm. not just a woman or not just an autistic person, but actually there is a bit of overlap. There's a bit of a relationship going on there. Mm. Also, statistically, women are much less likely to be diagnosed in younger life as neurodivergent, whether that's with autism or other things like ADHD, all that kind of stuff. Little segue actually, because this is something that I feel links in the same mm. way. Crash test dummies in like when they test obviously roller crashes coasters. and stuff. Yeah. yeah, and like car crashes. I love how your mind went to roller coasters. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, so when Fun. Yeah, so when everyone's at Alton Towers all the time. <laughs> like the physical dummy is only patented after a man. So like where the seatbelt should be, where the steering wheel is, it doesn't factor in like boobs. Which makes it makes sense in the in the misogyny world, but like it's just something that You've never thought that it's never been thought of, you know? Yeah. Wow. Men are so inconsiderate. Jesus Christ. So going back to identity, crash test dummies are really important <laughs> to me. It's really something. They're very resilient people. <laughs> they uh, are very resilient. They're great listeners. Um, so yeah, I'd say, I'd say for me, you know, the aspect of femaleness, what that mm -hmm. means to me. I think I strayed on the side of like femininity for a bit and then strayed away from it because I thought it was like a bad thing. And, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of finding the line with that. And that as an autistic person, I think me being an artist and like an intrinsically creative person is very, very much a core. Like the, one of the biggest things about both of us. Yeah. Like I think if I didn't have that, I don't know if I'd have a purpose. So I'm yeah. quite grateful to have it. Mm, and it's quite interesting, the term purpose, because your identity can, of course, be driven by any and all or none of these things. But for us, that I, I feel like we both mutually kind of feel we have a purpose and there's a reason we were put on this earth. Mm. And a big part of that was to create. And if I'm honest, I'm so grateful that I have that because Jesus I know Christ. that some people don't. And when they're trying to seek it out, I'm like, that sounds really stressful, but that isn't me. So really sorry about that. <laughs> if I was destined to be an accountant, Sophie, 
You love numbers. You're so good at counting. Yeah, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> so the next question I wrote down was, how do our identities influence our practices? Because we're kind of talking about like what makes up us, like we're both neuro- neurodivergent people. Of course, like my identity as a man, as a trans man, as somebody who has gone through a journey with their gender. So I've you know got my lovely business partner who mm. is a cis woman who has experimented with masculinity and femininity. You've had your like journey with being autistic and regaining ownership over that as mm. you've gotten older. Yeah. How do you feel like that has shaped, informed, impacted your practice? if at all. Fabulous question. I think for me, the way that my autism is prevalent in every day Mm -hmm. is how intensely and how often and how deeply I feel things. Yeah. And I think me having this empathetic outlook towards like both my own and then other people's experiences and wanting to kind of harmonise those two things. I think it's something that because I feel so deeply and I'm not saying that other people aren't capable. I don't want to come across like I'm an empath. Um, (laughs) I'm actually, my feelings are actually really complex because like sometimes I'm happy and like sometimes I am like sad. (laughs) No, not But like I think that the way in which I process emotions and the way in which I experience them Mm. is something that I want to try and recreate in an audiovisual scale. Through your sort of like translation of human experiences that you explore within your work. Yes. I completely agree. Like they really start to depict how intensely you can feel some of those emotions. I think it actually helps me a little bit because Mm. it helps, the strength of them kind of helps me decide what that looks like. What about you? What would you say? Um, I'm going to go into this a little bit more as we start to talk about some of the research that we've brought to the table. Mm -hmm. But the premise of the lens in which I view the world is the lens in which I'm depicting through my artwork. So the comfort and the intimacy that I find in the relationships I have and the relationships that I depict through my practice are fed from my identity as a queer man. However, this kind of like really beautiful intimate lens that I see big portions of the world through that I choose to kind of navigate my practice through has not always been the same and it's not always been there. For many, many years I had very intensely crippling gender dysphoria and I had quite a ropey childhood to say the very least. Um, As someone that knows you and loves you, I think that is a very concise term to use for an hour long podcast. (laughs) Yeah, so there was like, there were huge points in my teenhood Mm. where I honestly believed that nobody would ever love me, nobody would ever find me attractive, nobody would ever want to have sex with me. Um, Just because all those things are true doesn't mean that you have to... No, I'm joking. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's your boring me too. Nathan, don't you dare. This is the third and final episode of Heart Hunt. I'm trying to make light of it. I'm really sorry. It's funny. (laughs) It's funny. So, it's it's not always been there, like... The fact that my relationship with my current partner is my first ever relationship kind of says a lot about how I've navigated intimacy with other people. It really wasn't until I had surgery on my chest and kind of moved to university that I really started to reclaim like who I am and what I love and what I value. So I think I treasure intimacy with other men so much more. Like the times in which I'm shirtless with my boyfriend. Three, we're three and a half years after I've had surgery. So it's been, it's been a while. You know, I've been on testosterone for nearly six years now. Oh my God. So it's been a very long time, but it's still so precious to me and it's so beautiful. And there isn't a day that goes by where I'm not grateful for where I'm at with my body and therefore where I'm at with my partner. And that is the the biggest driver for my practice, without a doubt. That's so, that makes so much sense. Like I want to paint like beautiful intimacy because I'm so grateful for it. And I think you having the appreciation of like queer bodies, like mm. queer male bodies, mm. and like with your one of your collections that you put in the degree show where it was like queer trans bodies, yeah. and you're like, this is a beautiful painting, and this beautiful painting looks like me, therefore yeah. I'm beautiful. Like I didn't necessarily paint myself for my series that was called The Male Nude. Mm. Um, I worked with a, a good friend of mine, Ed, who thankfully like sent me some amazing references. And he was amazing to work from. Um, But something I wrote in my um, artist description was I see myself in them that becomes this kind of relationship between myself and the men I paint, whether it's me or not. Mm. Because I don't really do self-portraits at all. 
but I kind of improve the relationship I have with my body with each and every painting. This idea of identity Mm -hmm. can be so fluid and people that make identity-based work can be purely autobiographical. This is something I would also like to bring up as a bit of a disclaimer because Mm -hmm. this is something that we have experienced in different ways when we were at uni. Mm -hmm. And I think that when it comes to the idea of art and identity, I believe that the artist kind of needs to disclose what the identity-based thing is first. Mm -hmm. So if you see a woman artist and you go, woman art, feminist art, Mm. and actually that's not what she's saying at all, Mm. you're actually, it's pretty counterproductive what you're doing. I lost my dad to cancer in January 2021. And I was very, very close to dropping out of uni because I just didn't know what I was doing. And it was it was a very, very, very horrible time, like lockdown, everything like that. And I remember coming back into halls and making this like mask and it had like lots of numbers on it that had meaning and I'd written yeah. lots of letters and there were matchsticks and it was all really um, sculptural and it wasn't really mm. anything I did before. Like it was a product of some very, very intense grief. Yeah. And it was like an attempt to articulate whatever the fuck you were experiencing. Yeah, I just, I had to make something. Yes. Just immediately, like straight out of it. And I remember presenting it to a, in a crit. So for, for those who don't know, like a crit at university, you will essentially either join an online call or join, join in person. And there'll be a small group of you and some other students with a member of staff. And everybody will go around and kind of display their work and everybody will talk about it and ultimately critique it. Yeah. In this case, it was a bit like show and tell with a lot less self-esteem because (laughs) the way in which... So I wasn't really in a position emotionally to talk about the fact that I'd literally just lost my dad. Yeah. So I didn't talk about it and I was interested to see what it would come across like as just the mask itself and what people got from it. And I got told that it looked like the eyes looked like crotchless pants. And then it was like, oh, it's it's really female. It's so feminine and like looks like a wedding garb and whatever. And I was thinking, what the fuck? Like, this... I, it's a, right, it was a mask <laughs> that had some white on it. Yeah. But I'm like, you are only saying these things because I'm a woman. Oh, absolutely. And this is kind of what Sophie's prefacing is sometimes people can assign a narrative to your practice just because of either who you are or what you look like which is why you didn't really tell anyone about you being trans at uni because you didn't want people to go trans Trans artist artist. yeah like it was actually that kind of side of my identity because i transitioned really really young as a kid i went to university and i was very much in the closet i've been very cis passing for a really long time so i was like i don't want anybody to know i didn't actually come out to like the vast majority of our peers and the staff until my final year of university. It was actually earlier this year. Yeah. So we've both definitely gone on like a journey with our identities and our practices. And a lot of the kind of research that we're going to be bringing today is going to support that a lot of artists and practices are influenced by, at the very, very least, identity as a theme and a topic. Yeah. But just maybe if you go into a gallery space and you noticed a... you know, a person of colour making some work or a woman making some work or someone from a marginalised group. If there's an, if in the description or context about their work, Mm -hmm. it is about their identity and about their background, then of course you can have that narrative and have that lens. Absolutely. But I think people can be very, very quick to just kind of slap it on. Yes. And a lot of people don't necessarily want to be seen for that immediately yeah and want to be able to reclaim that the work they're making absolutely i mean the first thing that you want people to see in your paintings is not the fact that you're a woman making paintings i want people to see them in my paintings exactly like so the fact i'm really gorgeous and sexy you can discover (laughs) after that you know (laughs) absolutely do you want to start us off you've got lots of notes (laughs) your handwriting is ginormous (laughs) so big I thought I'd decide to talk about Gilbert and George because they're a really, really interesting pair. They title themselves as sculptors. They do not necessarily make sculptural work as you might traditionally kind of understand it. Mm -hmm. For example, what you would define as like a drawing with charcoal on paper, they would call a charcoal and paper sculpture as opposed to a drawing. Nice. So that's a really interesting lens. Um... So Gilbert and George were friends that met during a sculptural degree. Um, They are British artists. They are still alive today. They were born in 1942 and 1943. They incorporate themselves and their lives into their works by questioning stereotypes and social taboos. 
So they do a, an array of this self-titled sculptural work. They describe themselves as living sculptors or sculptures. Um, and they also do elements of performance art and they also do like kind of graphic printout. They're slightly like, they look somewhat illustrative mm. in some of their works. So they were a really, really interesting pair. I was just kind of looking into like a lot of queer artists for this kind of identity episode because it really is where my, my research flourishes. Um, and the way in which Gilbert and George introduce their identity into their practice is some of the boldest the art world had actually ever seen. Yeah. They became really, really prevalent in like the sort of 1970s, which was just a very interesting time. The law was changing. It was no longer legal to be homosexual in the UK, but there were still lots of restrictions. The main quote I took from my research from them, something that Gilbert and George have said is, they believe personal investment is a necessary condition of art. Yeah. Which is very definitive because I've always tried to have in the back of my head, people might choose to make work about nothing or they might choose to be so far removed. Mm. But I do wholeheartedly agree with that quote. I, I do as well. I think even if you are making work about nothing, it's a conscious choice and you're passionate about that. Because you're still making it. Yeah. And like it still comes from you. And this also kind of like leads me on to this book that Sophie and I found. And this genuinely sums us up as a pair. Sophie sees a nice book in a window and I've bought it about five seconds later. Um, so this book is called The Creative Act by Rick Rubin. It's just been classified by Waterstones as like one of the top 100 books so far this year. And um, similarly to Gilbert and George, Rubin describes art as a human condition. Creativity is a human condition. And it's inescapable because we all do it. Yeah. He says, we perceive, filter and collect data, then curate an experience for ourselves and others based on this information set. Which is really, really interesting when you're talking about identity, because I think regardless of how removed you would like to be mm. from who you are in your relationship to your artwork, I do still think it's inescapable. I think there is a definitive there. Yes. This is a conversation that we've had a few times at uni where there's this debate of technically isn't all art autobiographical because mm. if you're making it about something that interests you that is to do with your life so that means it's autobiographical you can't make work without having some sort of personal interest even if it's a disinterest yeah it's still yeah still making, comes from you yeah people can make work about things that they're really frustrated about but there's still a there's still a mm. passion there so just a couple of facts about Gilbert and George, just for those who are interested, because I I didn't know this. I actually researched them in my first year of university, but I didn't know all of this. Mm. So they can they were considered, or they consider themselves to be anti elitist, but they are very very right wing. Makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Gilbert and George. So I would describe some of their performance art is a little bit difficult to describe via a podcast. So I'll let you guys kind of research that of your own will. But some of their more graphic content contains, like, scat imagery. That's the one thing, that's the one image I've got in my head, um, where it's like, from the 70s, mm -hmm. it makes sense that it was very influenced by pop art. It's very yes. vivid colours, but essentially it is, if we're talking about what it is as a descriptive image, yep. there is a mouth, and there's faeces. And the faeces going in the in mouth. In the mouth. So, like, it's, um, it's very removed so it's not super graphic yeah i'll actually i'll put i'll put this up the thing you know they they explored this very like this is a social taboo and we're reclaiming it um but they were really vocal about supporting margaret thatcher they believed right. that socialism and i'm just kind of reiterating you know like articles and research they believe that socialism is an intention to make everybody equal and they used the word equal, God not forbid. the same. Um, but we want to be different, is what they said. Great. Because there seems to be this mutually exclusive term that equality equals being the same. Equality and equity are, yeah. Different sides I think of, a, if, of the same coin. So they, they do have some, some really strange 
sort of perspectives politically, but they did coin the phrase art for all. And they did believe, especially in such a pivotal time in art history in the, you know, f- even from the, the 1960s right up until, I mean, they were still making work in lockdown. Oh, wow. Yeah, they made a video diary in lockdown, so definitely check that out if you're interested. But yeah, there, there are an interesting pair of queers who have made some very, very graphic and very bold work. Mm. And they, they truly believe that you, you can't make artwork without an investment from elements of your identity. Yeah without absolutely loving Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> so yeah, would you would you like to kind of branch off? Go into something else about art and identity. Mm. So if we're going to talk about identity and we're going to talk about art, we can't do it without talking about the one, the only Frida Kahlo. Absolutely. The, the bitch. I love her so much. I think her identity was shaped very early on because the first ever article that was written about her the person she was married to, who was a mural artist, Diego uh-huh. Rivera, she was referred to as Diego's wife. Mm. The mural artist's wife is a painter. Not even her name. Not even her name. So Frida Kahlo was, very, and is, very, very, very famous for shamelessly, as she should be, depicting herself very, very often. The amount of self-portraits she's yeah. done. Some of like the, the largest body of self-portraits that have ever been made mm. on her scale and with her level of depth. And Absolutely this is... ast- astonishing. So there's a painting I would like to talk about called The Two Fridas. So as you can guess, there's two renditions of Frida Kahlo. It's almost life-size because I saw a photo of her stood next to it. Mm-hmm. It's, it's pretty large. And they're both sat next to one another and they're interacting with one another. Um, it was completed shortly after her divorce with Diego. She mm-hmm. had... She was very famous for having a very tumultuous relationship with Diego. It took up a lot of airtime in her life. They were very, very on and off. I've got a Frida Kahlo sketchbook and on the back she's just written his last name like loads of times in her diary. Like she was obsessed with him, but also Mm -hmm. like it was very will they, won't they. Mm. They're dressed in two different ways, the two Fridas. So one is a traditional Frida in Tijuana costume. So I was having a look at what Tijuana culture was. Yeah. I got, it was quite complex, but what I got from it was essentially from the pre-Columbian era, there were these markets where primarily women would make business, whether it was like they would be selling fruits or crafts Mm -hmm. or something that they would be responsible for and they were the breadwinners. So the costume that she's in is the kind of, uh, almost like the uniform Mm -hmm. of uh, of women in Tijuana culture. They made money, tended to be very independent women, but this meant that the husbands had it a bit easier mm-hmm. and tended to be lazy because right. of it. So interesting, like, is it a win for women or actually when you pull back, is it not? Yeah. So the one in the Tawana costume has got a broken heart, sitting next to an independent, modern dressed Frida. Mm-hmm. So you've got two different, like the clothing that's used is two different identities of Carlo. Yeah. In Frida's diary, she wrote about the painting and said it originated from her memory of an imaginary childhood friend. So again, that extra layer of identity of someone that you kind of forged mm. yourself. Like it's it's an extension of yourself, an imaginary yeah. friend. She admitted in the painting that her being heartbroken. So in the painting, the two Fridas have their physical hearts exposed mm-hmm. with all the arteries running up and down her arms. One's holding a pair of scissors and has cut one of the arteries. So it's yeah. all very... The interplay of both figures in the painting is very apparent. Mm-hmm. And she said it expressed her desperation and loneliness with the separation from Diego. The two Fridas are holding hands. The main artery, which comes to the right hand of the traditional Frida, is cut off with surgical pincers. Blood is dripping onto the white dress, which is the uh, the Tijuana mm-hmm. costume and she's in danger of bleeding to death the stormy sky filled with agitated clouds may reflect frida's inner turmoil yeah so there's lots going on in this painting that was from fridacarlo.org she sold that painting for four thousand pesos four thousand and thirty six pesos to be exact Mm -hmm. which is about a grand okay the 36 pesos was for the frame and then the rest was for the painting and Mm -hmm. it's the highest value she ever sold her work for in her lifetime was a grand it's one thousand pounds or the equivalent of yeah Wow. Yeah, I don't actually know if that's a thousand pounds today or a thousand pounds in nineteen thirty nine money, but probably the latter. But yes. Mm. But I just thought it was 
a very interesting one because with someone like Frida Kahlo, she had so many things in her life that shaped her identity and every self-portrait said something different yeah. because she went through, uh, when she got into a bus accident when she was 18. Well, yeah, she was chronically disabled for the rest of her life. She and experienced she, chronic pain. She was, yeah, she was in immense pain and that absolutely shaped her identity and what she was, her relationship with Diego and as kind of tumultuous and unfaithful as it mm. was that would have added to something as well absolutely a lot of her very like kind of visceral experiences a lot of the things she have shaped up who she was and who she became to be mm. had a huge narrative in her paintings i think with carlo's identity the thing that gave her solace from what i've understood with the research i've done from her mm. Is her reclaiming her identity as someone who's had very horrible things happen to them mm. and kind of creating something very beautiful out of them. When she was in hospital, she would be painting to make despite everything. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's really she's she was an incredibly powerful, driven woman, despite the fact that she had no like social power because it was never about that. Mm. And what I think is very interesting is that how she was introduced to the world as Diego's wife. But mm. I had to search Diego Rivera's work and what it looked like. But I, I, no one has to do that with Frida Kahlo. But I just thought it was a really good talking point because mm. from someone that I've painted a lot of self-portraits of me in my time and I've been criticised for it. No, I wouldn't go as far as criticised for it, but I've kind of been told that like, okay. like you depict yourself a lot, don't you, kind of thing. Mm. And seeing Carlo's work, I never once have looked at her work and been like... Oh, you paint yourself a lot, don't yeah, you? Yeah, you're like, oh, she's a bit self-absorbed because it was about... Yes, of course, you've got the famous, like her, like her beautiful face where you've got mm. the monobrow and you've got the really classic, like, flowers in the hair, like, it's really distinct look that Carlo had. But in every painting, you've got a little bit of an insight to her emotions and her life and her yeah. soul. And that's sort of what I get from it. I actually wrote something down um, in the book I referenced earlier, The Creative Act, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin. This is going to feature a lot in this episode because I'm currently obsessed with it. Everything you were just kind of saying is I actually wrote down a question for myself, which is how do people who do not actively create process their experiences and, and interpretations of human experiences? Because... Art therapy is very, very real, and it's something that and I... And it doesn't have to be as overt as the label art therapy sounds. Yeah, you don't have to make art. If you go feeling a bit lost, want to have a purpose, and you pick up a hobby, mm. you pick up knitting or lino print or... And I think because our identities are so fundamental to our practices mm. and how we create and what we create... It's actually really difficult to understand how people who don't actively make things, how do you how do you process your emotions? And I think, if you're I like, think something's got to give, hasn't it? Mm, and if you're struggling with your human experience and the way in which you're kind of seeing the world through your personal lens, maybe you need... Maybe just make something. A, for real. Just make something. Do a lino print. I did a Christmas lino print this week. So cute. Sometimes, like, hobbies shouldn't stress you out. I think this idea of having to create something, I think it can be used as a form of control. You've got this yeah. idea of a cause effect. I have made this because I say so. Mm. I think it's a way of actually having autonomy over things. So when you're potentially in a vulnerable place with emotions mm. or with your physical mobility, such as Carlo, and you're yeah. doing something where you're going, I am creating because I'm doing it and mm -hmm. I'm responsible for it. Those who do not engage in the traditional arts might be wary of calling themselves artists. They might perceive creativity as something extraordinary or, be or beyond their capabilities, a calling for a special few who are born with these gifts. Fortunately, this is not the case. Creativity is not a rare ability. It is not difficult to access. Creativity is a fundamental aspect of being human. It's our birthright and it's for all of us. Oh, I really like that. Because it's true! That is the opening of the creative act way of being. It is true. It's so true. And as much as being a creative, I would consider as a very big part of my identity, mm. I'm not going to deny anyone that right to also assume. It's like my mum. My mum does art, she does lino prints, and she's really good at it, and she doesn't think she's good at it. And I say to her, I, I call her an artist, and she goes, oh, no, I'm not. And you, you can't say I'm an artist. I'm like, yes, you can. Yes, you absolutely because can. Because you do something because you want to do it, because you feel compelled to do it, and there's an end result of something. And like That is something that you can look at visually. That's an artist in my books. And creativity is not 
it doesn't necessarily have to be the creation of something physical that you can encase in glass or or display in a gallery. Creativity can be as simple as making conversation. Being creative is finding a new route to drive home to avoid trafficking. Or is what he says. You do a food shop and you pick something out of the shelf and you go, what, what do I make for tea with this? Mm. What do I build around this? That's creative. Like, it's everywhere. The only, the biggest problem, and particularly in the UK, is creativity is beaten out of us. Mm. You are never taught the advantages that taking creative subjects at school, at college, for A-levels or at university, you're never taught the advantages of that. And it can lead you to feel or think that you are not either artistic or creative or have access to those abilities. And we are absolutely here to tell you that you do. And I think the sooner that you might allow yourself to be creative in whatever way suits you, you might be able to be more at peace with what your identity is as a creative. Absolutely. I love that. Look at that. He's called Mark Quinn, and this series of works is called Self from 1991, 1996, 2001, 2006, 2011. Okay. So five years apart. And essentially, it's 10 pints of his own blood that is frozen into a cast of his face. And I thought that was a fantastic example of identity because it's quite literally, as much as it's visually him, the solidness. Think about how big a head is. Like, that's huge. 10 pints of blood is a lot. Over how many years? 1991 to 22, over 20 years. So he did it, he made a new rendition every five years. Right. So to preserve it requires, so it's in like a silicon, from my understanding, there's a very thin silicon cast that's of his face. That is filled with blood and the whole thing's frozen. Mm -hmm. So in order for it to be a visible piece of work, it's got to be maintained constantly frozen so you can look at it, right? The work was made at a time when Quinn was an alcoholic and a notion of dependency of things needed to be plugged in or connected to something to survive is apparent since the work needs electricity to retain its frozen appearance. Oh, wow. So like this idea of a wider context so around identity. His clearly from that sort of statement, his um, identity at a point in time, not necessarily now, but mm. was dictated by alcoholism and he was navigated be, by that. He had to be plugged into something to survive and, mm. and that, was, that something can be different for all of us. Also interesting that he chose to preserve his blood because your alcohol levels are identifiable through your blood. That is... Oh, I didn't even think so of that. So that's really, like... Really interesting. And when you look at the physical... I'll show you the physical sculpture. So this is all of them. So I've not seen all of them. I think I've seen that one the most, because that's the first one. Yeah. And then the one from 2006. I just find it very interesting that with something like blood used in an art piece, your natural response is to be repulsed by it when it's mm. literally, like, the entire, like, part of us. Yeah, like, makes up so much of who we are. But we see it in like a separate way and we're like, ugh. Because mm. this makes me uncomfortable. Oh, me too. But I really, really, really like it. What it what it represents and what it stands for, I think is... I, it makes me want to touch it. Yeah. I want to be like... The yeah. idea of it being cold makes me, makes me feel really weird. Because I is, is cold blood like a Tango Ice Blast slushy? Oh my God. <laughs> Don't bring Mark Quinn to the cinema. You might get more than what you bargained for. So I just thought that was a very good example of like... There's like a literal sense, a yeah, yeah, yeah. visual sense of identity. Being translated through creativity and the production mm. of art. Because it says a lot about him that he's willing to do that mm. in the name of art as well. So Absolutely. I think it actually tells you so much about him being physically vulnerable, is mm -hmm. in giving his blood. Yeah. And also, you know, the idea of his alcoholism featuring as well. Absolutely. Would you like to yeah, take so us back in time? Let's, let's go back in time to my favourite just point of research, something, well, an, an era that has probably dictated all of my practice for mm. a really, really long time. So if we go back to the sort of late 1400s, early 1500s, this is the time of, of Pope Julius II. Mm. And we're looking at Europe, specifically Italy. Mm. And I'm going to introduce you to an artist you may know by his nickname. 
which is Il Sodoma, or in English, The Sodomite. Uh, his full name is Giovanni Antonio Bazzi, and he gained his, he was really quite famous painter. Mm. Not the most famous, he was a little bit overshadowed by Raphael. Raphael took his place as he painted for the Pope for a number of years. But he gained his title, Il Sodoma, for being known for having relationships with boys and young men. Now this was at a time where, if we think about kind of how history is taught to us, the queer na narrative through history is still only finding its feet. I would say like, it's probably only in the last, at most 10 years, the Tate has been really, really open about sharing articles on historians, through institutions like the Tate, mm. have only just started, sort of, you know, in the last decade or so, been open to the queer identities and narratives that underpin actually a lot of incredibly famous work. Mm. Despite the fact that they were made during the early 15th century Italy, it was very, very Catholic. Mm. Il Sodoma was a high Renaissance era painter. Um, so you're quite a lot of, you're kind of like very, very beautiful Renaissance, very dramatic, very smooth, lots of depictions of lots of young nude people. Mm. The, the occasional posed painting. Yeah, but he's got time for that. <laughs> Il Sodoma was very, very influenced by Leonardo da Vinci and by Raphael, who kind of overtook him a little bit. The latter part of his career was very much inspired by them. And you can see, if you look at their works in comparison, there are a lot of poignant similarities. Mm. So there's a particular painting by him that I did quite a lot of research on, and it's called Marriage of Alexander the Great and Roxana. Roxana. In said painting, a clothed Hephaestian, Alexander's intimate partner and bodyguard, has his hand on the shoulder of the marriage god Hymen. Art historians, via an article published by the Tate, deem this a reference to Alexander the Great's bisexuality. His relationship to Hephaestion remained even after his marriage to Roxana. Now, this is a painting about Alexander the Great, an incredibly famous individual mm. who very famously married a woman who had bisexual relationship, an arguably polyamorous open dynamic mm. with his wife. He had sexual relationships with men. And I just think at no point in education are you taught that some of the greatest warriors or dictators or popes, they, they, liked, they liked men. Okay, they were so bisexual, they were so gay. There was, was just also no gay. room for queerness in anything to do with like serious history. I mm. feel like queerness wasn't really taken very seriously. It's a lot of the time it's used in like a comedic way, like the idea of being gay is like funny, yeah, whatever. And like Il Sodoma and this particular painting, I think the only outlet he had publicly about his identity to depict it through paintings of others to shed a light on men who were openly and very comfortably having relationships, sexual and romantic, with other men. So it's just really, really poignant. And he, so Il Sodoma like really embraced his nickname as well. So he never had like a distaste for that nickname. He embraced it and he encouraged it because I think he just wanted to be himself. Mm. I think he wanted to be open. He didn't really care who knew about his sexual relationships, so that's... I think having a nickname like that as well kind of puts your identity first, but then also has a sense of anonymity as well. Mm, so it absolutely. Kind, of, kind of keeps him and a I bit think safer. because he was such a fantastic painter, he sort of got away with being a sodomist. Mm. <laughs> from a similar era, so from the Renaissance, I'm sure a lot of you, if not all of you, will have heard of Michelangelo incredibly famous intellectual painter, sculptor. He was fantastic. I read in an article yesterday that he <laughs> has been academically referred to as the Lady Gaga of the Renaissance. Love that so much. So powerful. Yeah. I love it. Now there was, because the society, especially in sort of like Western Europe, was so driven by strict Catholicism, there was also something running alongside Catholicism called Neoplatonism. And Neoplatonism is essentially the appreciation for God-given beauty. Despite being a devout Catholic, the idea of Neoplatonism gave Michelangelo the room to love slash admire men. 
Now, I just think this idea of appreciating God-given beauty was the gays going... It's a loophole. This is what I find very that interesting is also very common. about the Catholicism religion. When you see Renaissance works, very, very heavily religious, very intensely religious, mm-hmm. is you see Jesus and he's he's ripped... He's like And he's always up. very scantily dressed. He's scantily clad in his little <laughs> loincloth. Jesus. Like, oh, wow. it's just... The way for me is that it kind of feels like there's an element of repressed homosexuality, repressed sexuality due to mm, Catholicism. Absolutely. And it's being expressed through the admiration of the all-loving, all-amazing... God-given Je- beauty. Je suis Christ. Like, yeah, just yeah, yeah. the fact that it's Jesus means that you can kind of really go into detail about mm. how rocking his abs are. And if anybody, like, wants to, like, question, you know, Catholicism at the time, there are multiple theories mm. that Michelangelo had an intimate relationship with Pope Julius II. Which so the Pope, me. the head of the Catholic Church was probably having gay sex. Some more kind of evidence that supports Michelangelo, like theories about Michelangelo's identity, was he became a really prolific poet in his late 50s. Um, He wrote some really, really beautiful poems. Um, But what's most interesting is this poetry was for a, I'm gonna call him a boy, he was 17, Mm. called Tommaso di Cavalier, to Cavalieri. He was 17 and at the time Michelangelo was 57. Michelangelo wrote poems for him, about him, to him, essentially saying how much he loved him, Mm. how much he loved his body and how full of admiration he was for this boy. So if any art historians want to kind of smudge over how queer Renaissance painters were, actually how queer people have been for the whole of human existence, just send them our way. Send them to this podcast. I, I do think as well the vast majority, if not all, of the male painters in the Renaissance had some element of queerness. Mm. I think that appreciation for the male form, not necessarily saying you can't be a great realism painter back in the day and not be gay. There must have been, you know... I'm sure there was a little couple. Yeah, but I think, I think the... If you look at Renaissance paintings, they are so gay... Mm. there's so there's momentum there's drama there's yeah. beauty there's suppleness there's everything that's gay that's so gay go 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 so i'm gay. sure you can all imagine that as a queer young person trying to kind of really find my way through art history to just find representation of queer people it's all incredibly oppressed it was quite beautiful to kind of read and understand that for as long as mankind have essentially been on this earth, we've been finding ways to communicate our identities. And nine times out of 10, that's been through a form of creativity, more common than not through oil painting. Just Full in a circle. beautiful little nutshell. I would also like to take time to talk about this because it's a quote I've remembered from a very similar era, so it's Da Vinci. And he, one of his last, one of his dying words was, I have offended God and mankind because my work didn't reach the quality it should have. So even if you are quite literally one of the greatest painters of all time, your identity might not be validated because you still think your work is shit. That's... I have offended... God, you, you're telling me this man is not gay. Drama queen. <laughs> so I have dumb. offended God and all of mankind because my drawings weren't good enough. <laughs> Stupid. Okay, if he thought that about his work, then we're screwed. I'm on, but this is what gives me solace: is that this idea of like going back to this kind of like-mindedness between all creatives. Mm. Maybe we all just need to chill out a bit. We don't. Ev- we're never gonna think we're good enough, but we should trust in the fact that other people do. I don't look at my work and think it's an offence to God and mankind. And but maybe I sh- did. Maybe I should. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe we should, darling. I don't, I don't know. So yeah, just like a really, really nice kind of summary of some poignant queer history for some names that you probably do know of, but maybe some context that you didn't. Mm. And I didn't know any of that. Fantastic. God of marriage, Hymen. That's going to be my... <laughs> that's going to be the that's next That's going to be my icebreaker for the next few conversations I have. It's going to mm. be great. Like it's, it's just... I think it's really, really important to acknowledge. <sighs> like we've always been here. 
Yes. We've always been queer. The erasure of queer people and the erasure of queer creativity mm. and this idea that they kind of don't go hand in hand is absolute bollocks. Yeah. If you are diagnosed with autism, you are more likely statistically mm -hmm. to be a member of the LGBTQ plus community mm -hmm. and you are more likely to be creatively inclined. There we go. So it's basically just a circle. So... Birds of a feather flock together. Quite literally. Yeah. We're all self-deprecating artists who don't know what we're doing. And that's okay. And that is my identity. Yeah, bye. That sounds really good. The end. <laughs> there is a painting I'd really like to talk about. Oh, sorry, it's not a painting. It's a... Um, is it a lithograph? Um, it sounds like a... I should do some fucking research <laughs> on it, really. <laughs> but there's a painter that I learned about doing research for this podcast called Charles White and if I'm being completely honest I'm actually a little bit embarrassed that I didn't know about his work before mm -hmm. because oh my goodness she like me to put a pic essentially there's a work that I saw that really caught my eye mm -hmm. I typed in identity based art and was just having a bit of a look around the googles mm -hmm. and this, doing the googling. this painting just really struck me so Charles White was a Cuban artist he's a black artist and it's this drawing oh, wow. okay. it's a drawing it's a drawing it's a drawing so i was drawn to it <laughs> mainly because of the fantastic stylistic element mm. it looks quite similar to my work not yeah, to kind can... of go this artist is great and it looks just like <laughs> me <laughs> no but i can absolutely see why you've connected with this the piece. expressionistic so essentially this is called awaiting his return and it's a black woman so this is it's ambiguous whether she's a mother or whether she's a wife mm -hmm. and i think it's ambiguous as to whether she's a woman or not yeah definitely i think the kind of um kind of stylistic element mm. i think it is just like just des described i in... think it's i think word on the word on the artist street is that it is yeah she is a lady and this was made in 1945 so the year world war ii ended wow okay yeah and behind her, you've got a framed star, which is a military symbol. Mm -hmm. So very linked to war. Mm -hmm. And her, the look on her face, I can't stop looking at because every time I look at her, she gets less and less hopeful. Yeah. The, the title, I think, is fantastic, Awaiting His Return, because especially the year it was made in 1945 creates suspense already. Yeah. Because the war's ended. Is he going to come back? Mm. Who knows? And it's just the way in which it's depicted. Her eyes are so sad. Yeah. She looks... The Her pose is almost like she's bored. Yeah, she looks but bored But there's a lot of... The way it's been done is really, really amazing. Because there's so many sharp corners and really harsh shadows. Which I think holds a lot of tension in her body. Mm. You can tell that it's... She's not in a relaxed position. So, Charles White like I said before, Cuban artist, and his work was very, very prominent and focused a lot on the black experience. And this is from Cincinnati Art Museum, and I loved it, and it made me so embarrassed that I hadn't thought of his work, because listen to this description. Though his art focused nearly exclusively on African-American subjects, White speaks to viewers from all walks of life. He stated, I like to think that my work has a universality to it. I deal with love, hope, courage, freedom, and dignity, the full gamut of human experience. Oh, wow. And as someone who, who does in, that, who in my self proclaimed way <laughs> makes work about the human experience, I was not only appalled that I didn't know his name before, but it made me feel so much more connected to his work because with something like that, it really it's a it's a beautiful piece of work but also it gives me an insight into the black experience yeah which i think is something that when it comes to this idea of identity mm -hmm. i think white people tend to shy away from looking at and absorbing works that are about the black experience because they worry that they can't relate yeah and i think sometimes if not all the time i'm gonna say all the time white guilt can be very very uh dangerous oh yeah it absolutely and i think is. the black artists and artists of color out there that are making work to be seen and digested and understood mm -hmm. primarily in like by, by white, everyone yeah. and also by white people to articulate just a modicum of the black experience mm -hmm. 
I think is so important for everyone to absorb Absolutely. and this idea that you know he paints almost exclusively I see I keep saying paint I'm really sorry he draws he draws and makes work almost exclusively with black subjects mm -hmm. and I think this idea that it still relates to the human it's experience it's such a universal experience yeah and I think with this the fact that this is stereotypically not a human like a thing that everyone experiences because you know in 1945 we were not in the era yeah. of the war it was a very very specific Time. thing to experience and especially as a black person there's an element on top of that as well mm -hmm. that i think this just articulates in a fantastic way and it just really helps me connect with it absolutely and i absolutely love it and i'm so glad i managed to do the research i did for this episode because i now know about this yeah and it that just makes me so happy. And it's an it's another huge point for us when mm. we're not just coming onto this podcast to talk about things we already know. We are going away and we're researching and we're reading and we're like exploring things that we wouldn't necessarily naturally think to look at. And it's been so informative for us. Absolutely. And this is only episode three. This is what makes me very, very happy is that as much as there are things that I already know about and I'll drop in and mm. there are things that the listeners already know about where we talk about really famous works or mm -hmm. whatever, it's, I always want to expand my knowledge mm. and i think doing it in this way just helps like embed it in my brain that little bit more and i think on that note because we're gonna wrap up this episode but on that note please don't shy away from dropping any other artists works or influences in our comment section if you want us to talk about anything in a following episode please just let us know we will we make will. sure to do it because i think this discourse around fine art what people connect with mm. you know a piece of work that can be extremely controversial such as mm. um gilbert and george yeah works like that where people go it makes me furious or people go it makes me really happy or oh i like it but i know it's made by very intense right wingers like mm. all of this discourse is important and we're not just having this conversation with each other we're having it with people who like to watch us slash listen to us so Absolutely. please have that conversation back mm. so closing statements closing statements for us i would say art is integral to nope identity is integral to how we create art what we create and our relationship with creativity itself mm -hmm. i think that is a huge huge <laughs> very widely understood and experienced experience throughout a lot of history and a lot of artist practices the ones that you see the ones that you don't see the ones that you happily discover, I think identity is intrinsic to 99.9% .9 of them. And there's so much to discuss. There will absolutely be a part two on this episode because I just can't wait to talk about it some more. Mm. I think whatever identity is prevalent in mm. whatever people want to show about their identity, because I think as much as you can boil down identity to, you know, nationality or sexual orientation, things like that, mm. Your identity can also be shaped by things that have happened to you or things you love or things that make you laugh. Mm, or things you hate. And I think wearing that as a part of you and to encourage you to do other things because of that mm, and can to... be a really nice... It can just be like a nice little little window to do other things. Absolutely. Like, use your human experience and whatever that means to you as a funnel for creativity because what else do we have? Pe know? People are all we've got. Absolutely. And I think... That and cats. Well, yes. <laughs> oh, ask the Egyptians, to be fair. It, I do so well. People and cats are all we have. And I think that with this idea of identity, when you open up about things that are intrinsic to you and... I know I say the word, like, soul a lot, but I think it, I think it helps in this context. Like, mm. things that are a part of you and your soul, yeah. you know you notice other people's and then that's yeah. how you kind of convene together birds of a feather absolutely well that's I, us i have been nathan and i'm still sophie <laughs> thank you so much for watching slash listening and we will see you on the next one on the next one bye, bye. <laughs>